Greetings, this is Dr. Eric Landrum from the Department of Psychology at Boise State University, and this is the Psych 487 Capstone Perspectives Lecture on the three P's, Physiology, Phrenology, and Psychophysics. Each of these areas is another type of antecedent or precursor to the beginnings of psychology as we may formally recognize that in 1879 by Wilhelm Wundt. And so in addition to the prior antecedents to psychology, these are three separate lines of thought within the history of science that are going to contribute to this um, convergence of forces that are going to lead to the beginnings of psychology as a discipline separated from philosophy. So a very brief overview of each of these three items, uh, each of these three areas is in order. All right. So for physiology, and, and, and you know, and I, I'm just going to, you know, acknowledge this right up front. There's so much more that we could be covering. There's so much more and so that we could be talking about with regard to physiology and developments in the, you know, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. I'm going to give a, just a very brief overview. There are all kinds of resource materials available, not only uh, through my teaching assistants during office hours, but also the internet, the library, and so forth. So again, just a real cursory overview in how these items, these ideas contribute to the beginnings of psychology. So uh, physiology is, and by the way, as a psych major, we make you take uh, two semesters of anatomy and physiology. And so you should already know by now that physiology is the study of the function of cells, tissues, organs, and the organs of living organisms. Uh, and so as a, what's something that became a physiological question um, in the 1500s, I believe, although it might be in the 1600s or 1700s. Well, that's a pretty broad uh, spectrum when I think about it is a notion that came out of physiology and, and work in astronomy about the personal equation. And so, for instance, astronomers were charged with tracking the movement of planets and stars across the night sky to try to determine things like orbits and patterns and things like that. And um, so what would happen would be, as these two astronomers were trying to track objects in the night sky, Others would notice that their times were slightly off, and this led to this notion of individual differences in what came to be called the personal equation, that astronomers differ in reaction times. Some are slow, some they're variable, some are faster. And this was really a really nice this was a nice demonstration of individual differences. And so even watching the exact same event occur, two people could differ in their interpretation of the time it took that event to take place. And in astronomy and the scientists, this came to be, have a phrase called mental chronometry or reaction time. And so there are individual differences. And so, so the organs and systems and functions of, you know, our brains and reactions and decision making, um, those organisms differ from one another and those individual differences become variable and measurable eventually and studyable by psychologists. And so, again, as I mentioned earlier, that's a very brief overview of where we were, we were headed with, with regard to the founding of psychology. And you can understand the importance of individual differences and in psychological science and how we approach, you know, data collection even to the present day. So physiology is clearly one of the three P's. Phrenology is a different approach to a mind-body problem. You can recall that uh, Descartes talked about this when he tried to solve this famous idea, you know, is the mind and the body, are they two separate entities? Are they one thing? And, you know, how, you know, philosophers like to get themselves out of these, you know, conundrums. And so his answer was cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am. And that was a way that he could prove to himself from a philosophical standpoint that he existed. And so phrenology was one approach to the mind-body problem that, again, a, talks to and addresses this mind-body problem that the brain is the seat of the mind. That is, that's where the mind is located. So it's not located in some other system of the body, but it's located in the brain. And as you can see in this little picture, it's a, it's a classic depiction of um, how phrenologists at the time would have interpreted uh, bumps and uh, depressions on one's 
on skull and forehead, you know, by feeling uh, a person's head, essentially, and looking for uh, raised areas, which would indicate more of a certain trait or quality, and a depressed area, which would indicate less of a certain trait or quality. And so really the two founders who get to know this quite well are Franz Josef Gall and Joseph Spursheim. Uh, and and their, the basic fundamental belief of phrenology was that personality characteristics were interpretable by the bumps on a person's head. And so you can see this scan out of a book by E.G. Boring in the 1950s in the history of psychology that actually gives you the numerical links between the location on one's head and then the different types of either emotions or intellectual capacities uh, that might um, be impacted. And so if you kind of peek in on this, and so if we pick uh, area number 11, um, I'll pick number 12, self-esteem. So if you had, a, if so if someone were feeling around on your head, and let's see if I can find number 12. Oh, there it is. It's right here. So if I was feeling the back of your head, it, and by the way, we're not going to do this, not even as a class activity. So I was feeling back here on the back of your head, and I was feeling in area number 12. If you had a bump there compared to surrounding areas, if there was a raised area, that might indicate to a phrenologist that you have more self-esteem. If for some reason that there was a depressed area there where it felt like there's a little depression or a little crater there on your head, then by looking at area 12 and feeling that with my fingers on your head, I might determine that you have a little bit less self-esteem. And so phrenology, um, although it did a number of things kind of incorrectly, to how we believe the present day, really does make some contributions because you can start to see here uh, an attempt at a direct connection between uh, brain and body, between mind and brain. And so in this literal case, the shape of the brain, or not so much the shape of the brain, the shape of the skull would be related to psychological, emotional, intellectual properties and qualities and variables. Uh, you should know, by the way, that uh, you could see a phrenologist in the United States as late as 1912 in New York City. So a hundred years ago, you could have gone to a phrenologist in New York City and they would have felt your head and they would have felt for uh, bumps and indentations and then would have interpreted basic personality beliefs and characteristics uh, from that experience. So just to kind of recap this notion and contribution of phrenology, uh, the, the assumptions were that the skull accurately reflects the brain's shape. And by the way, that's actually not quite true. And so, you know, your, your brain is resting on, you know, in this, you know, um, nice little uh, complex notion of uh, cerebrospinal fluid, you know. And so when you feel the, the bone on your head, you know, if when you do that and you, and you feel that hard part, you're not touching your brain, you're touching the skull, which is protecting the brain. So even your skull is not a, as a, is not a one-to-one -one representation of the underlying brain matter. Because if you've seen pictures of brains and things like that, you know there are ridges and grooves, sulci and gyri, and so uh, your brain is not smooth like your skull might be smooth. Anyway, a second assumption of phrenology that the mind can be meaningfully analyzed into a number of functions. And even though some of the methodology might not get it right with regards to phrenology, this is a lasting contribution of phrenology. And so the, the mind is responsible for a number of different functions. And so we might not localize it as much as phrenologists did. We might not have these very minute little places where the eights, nines, and the tens mean three different qualities or traits or characteristics. But this is part that stays with us. And so we do know from neuroscience that certain parts of the brain have certain functions. And, so, and if you damage, do damage to one part of the brain, some motor functions may go away, but cognitive of functions may stay intact or take away parts of the brain and the ability to form new memories will go away. And so this is an assumption of phrenology that sticks with us and is quite applicable to the present day. This is kind of related to number two here, but number three suggests that faculties of the mind are located differently in the brain. That, okay, and again, um, we'll buy that part 
but after the semicolon, perhaps not so much. We don't usually tend to think about excesses correlated with the enlargement of the corresponding place in the, place in the brain and recession or indentation is a lack of that faculty. So on the one hand, if you think about it, it's a very reasonable attempt at generalizing and, and trying to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between what's going on when you're feeling the bumps in, in, in dents on the brain and the corresponding what's going on with the um, psychological qualities and characteristics. So, so we like the idea of localization. We like the idea of functions occur in different places. That's a very, it's a very valuable contribution to phreno from phrenology to psychology. But uh, this latter part about uh, a, a raised skull in one area means more of something, and a depressed skull in another area means less of something really didn't hold true for phrenology into the foundations and study of psychology as we know it. So the third P in our three P's is, is really part of an extended sequence of the antecedents to psychology leading up to the formal founding of psychology by eight, in 1879 by Wilhelm Wundt. comes from Hermann von Helmholtz, who, a, a German psychophysicist uh, who really studied uh, notions about perception and sensation and perception uh, and physiology gives us this very nice uh, demarcation if you will that um, it's the physiology it's the equipment that provide the sensations the data collection the data gathering if you will and it's the perceptions that we provide with our cognitive function that give us the interpretations in other words, you know, if you might recall from your general psychology experience, your Psych 101 experience, uh, there was probably one or perhaps two chapters, depending on your textbook, on sensation and perception. And so sensation is the data collection. It's the visual images impinging on your retina. It's the auditory signals, you know, being captured by the cochlea in your ear. Uh, it's, it's taste, touch, and, and smell. All, it's those, that's the physical data collection piece. It's our brains with the process of perception that, that, that then interprets those signals and tries to make sense of them. And here's a great example. If you see these train tracks going off in the distance, you know from personal experience that those train tracks really do not converge. It looks on the screen that these train tracks are very far apart, these rails are very far apart, and it looks down here as if they, they are about to converge at some place down in the future. And you, you understand by cognitive processing, by, by the process of perception, that even though the sensations are telling you that those rails are going to converge, they really don't. Okay, unless it was some sort of tricky optical illusion, and it's not in this case, you can understand that those rails are not going to converge. And so we've got that, that co cooperation and coordination between the physiology, the data gathering, and then our brain's impinging and interpretation of that, that's the perception. And so we know those railroad tracks look like they converge, but even though in reality they are parallel all the way down the track. Otherwise, trains really have problems with that. And so, the, and, and the study of those types of scenarios, that sensation perception relationship, how we interact with the physicality of the world around us, uh, came under the purview of psychophysics. And in fact, psychophysics still exists today. And so, if you have someone like Dr. Hans in our psychology department who studies um, polygraph and that notion of connecting uh, the physicality of uh, brain waves and um, looking at uh, EEG and galvanic skin response. And you try to connect that to, for example, lie detection. That's, the, that's a similar notion of looking at how these actual sensations that the body is perceiving or giving off in this case are related to perceptions. And so psychophysics still exists today and there are psychophysicists around the world who still study these phenomena. So here's a nice example, just a couple of examples from psychophysics that uh, tend to stick with us and that you would read about in an introductory psychology textbook. Uh, Ernst Weber, or, or, or Weber, uh, by the way, in uh, German, the W is going to sound more like a V, so Wilhelm Wundt, so Ernst, Ernst Weber, uh, late 1700s, early into the uh, three quarters, into the 1800s, actually. And Germany uh, did, had this idea about a two-point threshold. And by the way, you can do this with all the different sensory systems. I think I've got some examples here. I do. So the two-point threshold is the distance 
between two points when two different points can be detected. And so if you're familiar with calipers are or, or two different uh, pencil points, for example, um, how far, so, so take for example, you've got two pencils and you're holding them kind of like chopsticks and you put them on the back of your hand. How any, and you were to close your eyes or you have someone else do this to you that you trust, obviously, and you close your eyes. How far apart would those two pencils if you're holding them, holding them like chopsticks, have to be before you can figure out that's one point or two. All right, and that's the notion about a two-point threshold that more broadly is talked about in psychophysics as a JND. And you see that there on the screen. A JND is a just noticeable difference, a JND. And so that when we talk about that, and so you can see this lady holding these weights. So for example, the JND for weights is 40 to 1. If you are lifting a weight in your hand, it's 40 to 1. Now what does that mean? That means that if, and you look at these weights that she's holding, if you are, if you, if one of those was 40 pounds, and, and it's not, you can pretty much tell by the size of it, but just play along, okay? Um, you can tell by, so if one of those was 40, 40 pounds and the other one was 41 pounds, you would not be able to tell a difference. Tip, generally speaking, the JND for lifting weights is 40 to 1. If one was 41, the other one was 42, you should reliably be able to tell a difference. So the just noticeable difference, the ratio of lifting weights, is 40 to 1. However, if I were to, if you were to hold your hands palms up and I were to place weights into your hands, the J and D changes, and you can see that at the bottom of the screen, from 40 to 1 to 30 to 1. In that case, you could tell the difference between 30 and 31. I'm sorry, you could not tell the difference between 30 and 31, but you could tell the difference between 30 and 32. Okay, so that tells us about, you know, just notice, just noticeable difference with terms of weights, but it's, there's also versions out there for vision, for smell, for taste, for touch, uh, for sound. And so psychophysicists studied that and, and the application of that. And so, uh, you can start to realize that uh, if you wanted to have two different signals, let's say on the train tracks or in a factory, uh, that might be important to know how much different do those signals have to be before someone can actually tell there are two different signals there. Or imagine lights off in a distance. You know, if you wanted to have the perception of a flashing light, you know, what would have to be the rate or speed at which we would see two different lights as opposed to one light on all the time? And so that's that notion that uh, Weber came up with and others after him uh, of uh, just no noticeable difference, and in this case, a two point threshold. And probably, and finally, who we're going to close this out with in terms of psychophysics, uh, uh, who you can see there at the bottom of the screen was called the father of experimental psychology, is Gustav Theodor Fechner, who lived in the 1800s. And, and really, he comes along and kind of formalizes and, uh, and I wouldn't say legitimizes, but formalizes this notion of, of psychophysics as the science of the functional relationship between the mind and the body, between the materials at the mental cognitive processes. Again, you can you can see the influence of philosophy and philosophical thought because that mind brain problem, that mind so does the mind control the body or does the body control the mind? That ongoing debate for centuries, millennia in philosophy and philosophical thought uh, is an active front and center uh, proponent or idea here in terms of psychophysicists who are who are making that segue from those important philosophical ideas to their measurement. You remember Francis, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, you know, how many teeth does a jackass have? Well, it was a pretty big deal in the 1600s for him to say, let's go out and count that. Well, that theme continues here. And so rather than think about mind and body relationships, uh, folks like Helmholtz and Weber and Fechner are actually going into the laboratory and actually trying to extract formulae and um, ideas that can represent this. So, for example, like a just noticeable difference. So anyway, and so Fechner comes along. He's the formal founder of this. He's called by some the father of experimental psychology for his implementation of rigorous research methods. And, and he tries to, to quantify this functional relationship. So maybe not one-to-one, -one, but there is a reliable relationship between 
the materials that our body experiences and the mental thoughts that our mind processes. And he wrote about this, and this is actually one of the cover pages to uh, a famous book of his. It was, of course, written in German because he was German. And the story goes that Fechner had been ill for a certain part of his life prior to the date that you see there on the screen. And uh, he, and he, I think he was close to probably death, as the historians write about it. And he had struggled, and he had been in and out of consciousness. And then on this one day, October 22nd, 1850, he, the, the, the fever breaks. He rises up in bed, and he says in German, essentially what gets translated as... The amount of sensation in the mind depends upon the amount of stimulation in the body. And he has this revelation on October 22nd, 1850. So by the way, just as an aside, there are psychology departments around the world who on October 22nd of every year will celebrate Fechner Day. So as you look at that and you go, hmm, the amount of sensation in the mind depends upon the amount of stimulation of the body, you might go, Wow, really? That's a big deal? And the answer is, in the development of the history of psychology, yes, it is a big deal. Look at that second bullet. So now, someone is making the leap that sensory contents can be measured. They can be quantified. We can get a score. We can get a dependent variable. This helps to make psychology quantitative, our quest for numbers. And so we want to measure stuff. We want to know what's the ratio of uh, the just noticeable difference with different perceptual situations. And so this idea, and again, it doesn't look like it's, it's much, but it really is a fundamental turning point in the development and the antecedents leading up to the founding of psychology. The sensation in the mind depends upon the, the amount of stimulation of the body. And so if we have a light that is 30 foot candles bright, and there's actually a way for physicists who can actually figure out the brightness of light, and there's a scale, and one of those scales is foot candles. And so if it, so the more foot candles of light that we create through scientific study and the use of psychophysics, Fechner hypothesized that the more physical light, the brighter it is, the more physicality in the world, the more we perceive that. And so it may not be a one-to-one -one relationship, but there are some relationships in there that are statistically reliable and valid. And so the brighter the light, the brighter we perceive the light. The lower the decibels, the quieter something sounds. Um, the closer the two-point threshold pinprick on the back of your hand, the more it feels like one point rather than two. And so we start to see this translation from the physicality of the world and, and visual stimulation and oral uh, sound waves and touch and taste and smell. We start to see uh, that realization that it's the, it's the physical aspects of the world. It's the sensations that we acquire that are influencing the perceptions we experience. And again, you tend to go, wow, big deal. It actually was a big deal, October 22nd, 1850, because now we can measure. Now we can quantify. Now as we measure the world around us, it has relevance to what we see and experience and what we feel in all of those types of situations that we'd like to study in psychology. And so you can, I hope you can see how that antecedent to psychology really plays a role in what psychology is about to become in the late 1800s, 